All right, um, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Uh, my name is Marit van Dijk. I'm a developer advocate at JetBrains and a recent Java champion. Um, who here is a Java uh, developer? Okay, oh, that's okay. For the rest of you, my ex code examples will be in Java, but it's about reading code and sometimes reading code in an unfamiliar language. So I hope you'll be able to. Uh, follow along with, with the principles, at least. So I'm here today to talk to you about reading code. And the reason I want to talk to you about reading code is that, as developers, we actually spend more time reading code than we do writing code. Uh, we read code when we're adding features, fixing bugs, uh, trying to understand a new uh, code base that we might be working on, when we're doing code reviews and hopefully figuring out how someone solved the problem. Uh, when we're learning about new technologies or new languages or new concepts, etc. It's part of uh, lots of our uh, daily tasks. Uh, in fact, developers on average spend as much as 58% of their time comprehending existing source code. Uh, and this is from research in a book by Feline Hermans called The, the Programmer's Brain. And Feline Hermans is uh, a professor of computer science education uh, in the Netherlands. And she wrote this book about what developers should know about cognition uh, that can help us with our, our daily job. So we spend more time reading code than writing code, but we hardly ever practice reading code explicitly. We might practice writing code, doing coding challenges or uh, coding katas, but we don't practice reading code, even though it's a huge part of our job. So Felina is also a speaker at conferences, and she had a talk at Strange Loop in, I think, 2019, where she ta talked about how to teach programming, which is her research domain. And she discussed uh, some research that she did that was done in the early 90s, where um, they split a group of students into three groups, and the students were learning programming and programming concepts. The first group wrote a lot of code and read code. The second group wrote code and read code with explanations of how that code came to be, what choices were made in the implementation, etc. And the last group only read code with explanations, again, of how that code came to be, design choices that were made, implementation choices that were made, etc. And they found that actually the second and the third group, who had read code with explanations, were better able to reproduce, understand and reproduce the programming concepts while we normally learn programming by writing a lot of code. Um, so that was a very interesting finding. And after that talk, someone came up to her and said, but what if we practice reading code explicitly? And that's how Code Reading Club was born. And I heard or read about that somewhere, and I was like, oh, that sounds amazing. I want to do that because I want to practice reading code. I spent a lot of time learning to write code, and then working on code bases, not understanding uh, some of the parts of the code base, I want to practice and get better at it. So I was very lucky in that a friend reached out and said, hey, we're starting a code reading club. Do you want to join? I'm like, yes, I do. Amazing. I love it when the universe aligns. Um, so I joined a code reading club. And what we do in code reading club is we uh, take turns. We have a monthly club. We take turns facilitating uh, uh, the session. So we select a piece of code, and it can be code that someone has written themselves or that we you know, find on the internet, on GitHub or, or something. Uh, make sure that it's one or two pages long, so not too long. We print the code, and then we do structured exercises in reading this code, trying to figure out what this code does. Um, so this, the, the picture in the background is from an actual session that we used. So you, know, you get to play with colored markers, which is fun. Um, when do we get to play with colored markers as adults, you know? Um, so I'll give you some examples of exercises just to give you an idea if you're not familiar with Code Reading Club. So uh, a general session that we have might consist of these exercises. The first exercise is called first glance, and that's literally what it is. You take one minute, you look at the code, and you write down the first thing that you notice and why that's what you notice, and the second thing. And it's very, really interesting if you do this in a group of people, because some people will notice, oh, hey, I noticed this term or this word, and I know what that is. So that gives me a starting point. Or, 
I notice this syntax and I have no idea what that means. So that gives me something to research before I try to understand this code. The next uh, exercise might be to identify concepts in the code and how they are related. So um, in the picture you just saw, we, we circled the variables and then trace where they are used throughout the code. We find the methods, trace where they are used in the code. Um, and if you do that on a piece of paper, you get kind of a graph of how the code flows, if you will. Uh, the next exercise can be to identify the, the five most important lines of code in this piece of code. And since our group consists of developers, testers, coaches who work in different languages, if you don't discuss what most important means, you get varying opinions on what most important it means. So some people might select the most important lines, the ones that help them understand this piece of code, like the name of the class, if the class actually covers what the code does, or the, the name, um, or a comment that explains what the code is about. Others might select the lines that determine the control flow throughout the code. So if I take these five lines, I have a general idea of what the code does. Or the testers in the group who are like, oh, but these lines, I need to pay attention because we, I see a bunch of test cases here because there are decisions being made. Um, so that's also very interesting. Uh, the next might be to identify concepts, either uh, in terms of domain knowledge that the code represents, or programming concepts that are used in how the code is, is um, implemented. And the final exercise might be take five minutes and summarize what you think this code does. And even though the previous exercises didn't explicitly address the meaning of the code, apart from maybe the concepts, by working with the code in these, in these uh, exercises, somehow you get an idea of what the code is. And at the end, most people are able to somewhat accurately describe uh, what the code actually does. And I really, really love this experience of being in a code reading club, not just because I learn ways of reading code and improving my skills of reading code, but also I really love getting other people's perspectives and noticing or, or learning what they notice about the code, which might be things that I didn't even think about, but also being very explicit about my own assumptions because you're discussing this code and by, by making it more explicit, oh, this is what I notice and why, um, yeah, I, f I found that very interesting rather than implicitly just making assumptions. So the whole point of reading or, or code reading club is to read code to understand the code and not to judge the code. And this is very difficult because <laughs> I could tell from your laughter, thank you. So usually when you look at a piece of code that you didn't write or that was written by you a while ago, which is a different person because you learned so much more, um, you notice things that you don't like and that you would like to change. And uh, I like practicing reading code for understanding because it really helps you in your day job as well by first understanding, you know, why is this code th this way and then making changes if you feel that that's, that is necessary later on. Felina describes three reasons why reading code is confusing in her book. The first is the lack of knowledge. Second is a lack of information. And the third is a lack of processing power in your brain. So a lack of knowledge might be, um, like we mentioned, in the programming domain or the business domain. So programming domain might be an unfamiliar language, syntax you've never seen before, or don't quite remember how it works, programming constructs or algorithms that you don't know. And of course, in the business domain, it might be domain concepts that are new to you if you're switching teams or even uh, uh, companies or industries, or business logic that you're not familiar with. You can deal with this lack of knowledge by creating a list of the things that you don't know when you're looking at a piece of code, researching those, and in certain cases, if it's unfamiliar syntax that you find again and again, you might want to actually memorize that syntax. Even though you can go Googling, like, how do I write a switch statement or uh, whatever other programming concept, if you encounter it a lot, it helps if you actually store it in your long-term memory so that you don't have to context switch and go looking for it. 
Uh, and the reason that I suggest, or actually Felina suggests to create a list, is it will give you um, something to check off. If you just go Google the first thing that you notice that you don't know, you might end up going down a bunch of rabbit holes, and you won't know at the end whether you actually researched all of the things that you wanted to for this particular piece of code. A lack of information might stem from different reasons. There might be unknown details, like a standard library method that you don't remember the, or don't know the implementation details of, so you might know, not know exactly how it works. There might be unfamiliar names used in the code. I spoke with some people from the, and I hope I'm saying this right, for Sakaringskassan yesterday. Thank you. <laughs> um, learning Swedish as we go. So they told me that in their code, because uh, for the non-Swedes, it's a Swedish governmental organization for social insurance. Um, so they use variable names in Swedish. So if you're a non-Swede, you'd have a hard time reading that code. Um, code might be connected in, diff in unknown ways that you can't glean from the code that you're looking at. Or there might be too many things going on at once, uh, making it hard for your brain to, to um, store the information. All of these are related to your short-term memory. And you might have learned that your short-term memory can hold seven plus or minus two things. Has anybody heard that before? Turns out it's actually less than that. It might only be like two to six things that your short-term memory can store at once. So dealing with a lack of information, something that can help is chunking things together. Um, for example, if you have a classic for loop, we all know a classic for loop. So, <laughs> thanks. Um, if you have a classic, actually, let's look at one. Um, so if we have a classic for loop, you, have, you start with i, the condition where it ends, and what you do in the meantime. So let's say you're new to programming, you don't know a classic for loop, each of these things might take an individual slot in your short-term memory. Whereas if you're more familiar with this concept, you'll be like, oh, for loop, one chunk in your memory. So familiarizing yourself with concepts can help and chunking them together can help uh, dealing with a lack of information. The final reason code can be confusing is a lack of processing power in your brain. If there's just too, many, too much going on, too many processing steps, too many variables to keep track of their value. Um, you know, if you have a God class that does everything, or if you have deeply nested code, or um, we've all seen uh, reasons why code is, has too much going on for us to keep track in our mind. Um, here, uh, re, um, sorry, can't English. Um, ways to deal with this uh, are using memory aids. If there's too much going on, offload some of that information uh, to lower your cognitive load. So one way is by using a dependency graph. Uh, this is an example from Code Reading Club where they used some Erlang code, uh, where they did the exercises like marking variables and tracing them throughout the code. Uh, by marking that on a piece of paper, you visualize the graph of how the variables are used throughout the code and how the methods are used throughout the code. And that can help you visualize what's going on. Um, another way could be if you have um, a nested loop and you're trying, or you know, using a, an example that hopefully everybody can follow to illustrate a state table, you can trace the values of uh, the variables throughout the nested loop. Of course, you know, use this for examples from your own code where a lot is going on. Um, so now that we know uh, what might makes reading code difficult, it might help us to be more of aware of how our brain works. So that if we're looking at a complicated piece of code, we can figure out, oh, which of these tools can we use? But reading code has uh, several dimensions. Oh, I'll get to that next one, sorry. So another thing that can help us if we're confronted with a piece of code that we don't know where to start is we can go back to the structured exercises because they will give us a way to start dealing with that piece of code. So next time you're confronted with a piece of code where you're like, okay, I have no idea where to go with this. Think about using one of the exercises and it, it will give you a place to start, and that, that will make it less scary. So there are several dimensions of code reading. 
we can look at the structure, the domain represented in the code, the concepts, and the context of a piece of code, so in the bigger code base, or maybe even the history of that code base. In terms of structure, code is not read linearly. It's not run linearly either. When we read a piece of code, we don't read it from start to finish, like a book or an article. We scan the code, so we look at the shape of the code. We use white space as hints. We use anchors, like the names of the class or the methods, um, to get a general idea of what the code does before we dive into specific before we dive into specific pieces of the code, uh, the method that we're actually looking for that has the behavior that we need to change or um, whatever. So we, we scan the code rather than lead it, lead, read it from start to finish. Um, the domain consists of both the behavior of the code and the data that it uses. Um, so, for example, we can look at tests that can tell us what the code does. Hopefully, there are tests, right? Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> and we can run them through the debugger to figure out uh, how the code works. And we can look at what kind of data or the values of the data through the debugger. Um, as mentioned, the code will, will contain both domain concepts and programming concepts, so we need to figure out which are used, whether we know and understand them, whether our understanding is correct, because a certain business term might mean something else in a different system or in a different company. Uh, and finally, the context of uh, the code. Um, so. Obviously, your IDE can help you with this. If you're reading code on a piece of paper, you can use the exercises, but in your IDE, you can actually work with the code. So uh, one thing is, uh, you know, one of the fun things about DevRel is you get to break code so you can fix it again. So I misformatted this. Obviously, if you're using an IDE, you can reformat the code to slightly improve the structure to make it easier to read. Um, like I said, um, you can work with the code. You might want to refactor it a little bit into a style that you are more familiar with to make it easier for you to understand. Um, even though we're reading code to understand it, not to change it necessarily in the beginning, it might help you to refactor a little bit to a style you're more familiar with so that it's easier for you to understand. So, for example, we can change the classic for loop in Java to an enhanced for loop that iterates over all of the things. Or if we're more familiar with um, streams, we can change it to a stream, uh, just to change it to a paradigm that you're more familiar with so it's easier for you to understand. Obviously, if you're just doing this to help you understand the code, you throw this all away at the end. Um, and as you get better understanding of the code, you might also uh, want to rename variables as you more properly understand uh, what they mean. So, for example, we can rename this to albums. I use some albums by The Cure. So we can work in our IDE um, with the code a little bit to reshape it to help um, match our understanding of the code or help figure it out. In terms of the structure of the code, um, we can use our IDE to either expand all of the code, which means that we can't see all of it at once, but we can also collapse our code in the IDE, which we can't do on paper, of course, um, and then just expand the, the section that we're actually interested in. So this can help us with a lack of information, so we can expand only the section that we're interested in, uh, for example. Uh, I'm jumping in between different projects for different examples. Sorry about that. Um, so let's say we're looking at a class. Um, I'm using one of the examples I'm using is a Spring Pet Clinic, which is a demo project by the Spring team. Um, it's, it represents a, a, a veterinarian service, so you have owners and pets and, and veterinarians. Um, so let's say you want to look at one of the controllers. You can look at the tests for that class. Um, 
hopefully the test names will be in a way that they express the intended behavior of the code. Uh, we can run a test through the debugger, if the debugger would kindly start. Um, and if we run the code through the debugger, we can look at the values of objects, variables, and run through it, step through it one by one. So here we see we have the information on what the, what the values are of our objects and variables. We can see them in the debugging window as well. We can see the um, stack trace, and we can step into or step over our code to see how the control flow runs through the code. Um, if you're using a framework like Spring, at some point you'll end up in the uh, Spring uh, classes. If those are not what you want to try and understand what's going on, you can wait, run the rest of the test. So you can use the debugger uh, to help you understand how the code is being used, observe objects, variables, etc., cetera, and, and the call stack. For the context of the code, you might want to look at, uh, for example, the Git history, if you want to figure out how code came to be in the way that it currently is. Uh, not the spring code, but our demo code. So we can use Git integration, or we can use Git from the command line, if that's what you prefer. And we can uh, check for, um, let me see, the diff, so what was re most recently changed here in the code to give us some, some understanding if that's what we need. We can look at a particular uh, commit and see it as part of the commit history, uh, the commit message, what else was changed in that code. And we can, uh, if we have, if we're using AI tools, we can uh, ask it to explain to us what the changes were. Uh, so in this example, these changes were made because of uh, sonar cube rules. Um, it takes a while for the for an AI assistant to write all of that out. So let's close all of that. What? I don't know. I didn't write the code. We can look at that at the end, uh, Pasha. Um, so, you know, just some of the ways that your IDE can help you if you're looking at a specific piece of code, you can use the features that your IDE has um, to help you understand the code. So the strategies that we used is we looked at the structure. We can identify uh, components and relationships in that code using the dependency graph. We can identify concepts, uh, research those, and gain some context of how the code came to be. Another way to look at uh, what your code does is to look at a slice of the application for a section that you're currently interested in. Um, so you start by finding a starting point, like basically a thread to pull on. Um, and depending on what the task is that you're working on, whether you're trying to understand a new code base or working on fixing one specific problem or making changes in a specific area, the starting point that you uh, select might be different, so it might be more generic, like a main method or an endpoint in a web application or a button in a front end and trace behavior from there. Or it might be more specific, an error message that you see in the logs that you want to figure out or the location where an exception is thrown or where the bug occurs or specific functionality that you need to change. Um, and you'll search and navigate um, using your IDE. So. For example, from the controller, oh, it has, because I hit command D, uh, Pasha, that's why it has two, two returns. <laughs> um, see, all fixed. Um, so, um, using a web application as an example, you might go from a particular uh, endpoint and then uh, see how it goes from there. This is a fairly flat application, so it doesn't really do a lot. Um, you get information from the database or you store information in the database. There isn't a, a service layer in between that has a lot of logic, but you can use your IDE to search and, and navigate um, in your code. 
Um, so the strategy is to select uh, a section of the code that you want to look at uh, and trace the behavior from there or trace the, the call stack from there. Um, if you're looking at... So the other application that I'm using is Cucumber JVM, which is the Java implementation of Cucumber, which is a behavior-driven development uh, library. Not really relevant for my example, but it's an example of a larger code base than the, the Spring uh, demo application, so I'll use it to illustrate some other um, examples. Uh, for example, let's say we're looking for shortcut conflicts. No, not really. Um, we're looking for a place where an error is thrown. We can search in our code base for where an error is thrown, and then basically instead of top down from the endpoint or the button or whatever outside in, we can trace inside out where does this error occur and then trace it back up to how it got there. Uh, so in this case, it's uh, in a catch block. So what happens in the try block, what method is called, we can trace it all the way back up. Um, and we might want to see, nope, where in the code we currently are, so we can use our IDE to uh, find basically a you are here in the code, um, if that helps you uh, with a little bit of context of where you are. Finally, um, we might need to understand a code base that is new to us when we're joining a new team or a new organization, or if we're using a new code base because we inherit it from a different team, or if you want to work on an open source project and you want to figure out how this open source project works or you want to uh, contribute to it. Um, so here we might need to, from scratch, figure out what does this code do. Um, and hopefully if you're joining a new team or a nor new organization, your teammates will be able to help provide you with some context because not everything can be captured in the code. Um, you might want to know what is the purpose of this application that we're working on? How did it came to be? Um, what is the wider context in the landscape? What other applications um, communicate with our application? What other applications do we communicate with? Who are our users? What is the current state of the code base? Is it very new and we're actively adding features? Are we basically only in maintenance mode? So we need to make sure that it keeps running, but we hardly ever change things. What areas of the code are we actively um, working on and what areas of the code do we hardly ever change? Uh, not all of this can be captured in the code base itself. So if you're onboarding new people to your team, please make sure that you provide them with the, the Cliff's notes of your codes or like an introduction of uh, what's relevant to help them also get quickly up to speed with that code base. Um, a good place to start if you're joining a new, new team is to at least check out the code and make sure that you can build it. On the last team I was on before I joined JetBrains, this was literally one of my onboarding tasks. Like, these are our, our code bases. Clone them all, make sure that you can run them. If you're new to a company especially, this will quickly tell you whether you have all of the right stuff installed and whether you're able to build, build all of the repositories, but also whether they have the right information um, available for you to know how to build and run uh, the application. Uh, so again, here your IDE can help you. You can look in the README for this information. Not all Readmes are created equally. Um, I've <laughs> You're familiar with this. <laughs> so if you have a good README, hopefully it will tell you how to build the project, how to run it locally, how to run the tests, maybe where to find additional document documentation maybe some hints on specific technologies that are used or specific patterns that are used. Um, but I've also been on teams where each repository had a different way of building it. None of it was documented, so one of the first things that I did was to each read me at, okay, this one uses Jetty, this one uses Tomcat, this one, <laughs> etc. cetera. So, um, you can look at the project structure, obviously, to give you some hints. Uh, I recently saw a talk by Oliver Dropbon from the uh, Spring team where he said, you know, the project structure will represent whatever uh, architecture book was most recently read. <laughs> um, so thanks for that quote. Uh, and you might look at the dependencies in the code base and draw some diagrams either yourself or using tools. Um, so let's take a look at that. 
Um, so if we have the Spring Pet Clinic, which is, uses Maven and Gradle, uh, we can build it just to make sure that we can before we make any changes, because if you only find out that it's broken after you made your changes, you need to figure out whether it was you that broke it or whether it was already broken. Ask me how I know. Um, so uh, while it's building, which we already know it will, uh, we can take a look at the um, project structure. This is a fairly small application, so we can look at the source um, and look at the packages, and these will give us a fairly clear idea of what this application does. We have owners, pet, pet owners in this uh, 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 context, and pets, and we have the veterinarians, and then we have uh, some classes that are more system and implementation related. But if I would need to make changes in this application, it's not very large, I might be able to quickly find where I need to be. Um, while it's still building, there you go, build success. So now I know that if I make changes and, I, and it's broken, I broke it, uh, which is a good start, or hopefully I won't break it, but at least it's a good start to have an idea uh, that we can start making changes. If we look at Cucumber JVM, which is a library, it has way more modules. So from here, if I wanted to make changes, I would have a way harder time of knowing where to start, or even if I wanted to understand how this code base works, because we have so many modules. Um, the fact that one is named core gives us a hint that that might be a good place to start, uh, but that not, might not always be the case. Um, so if we want to figure out from these modules how they are related, um, we might need to use some additional tooling. So I'm a little bit familiar with this project, I know that most modules have a readme that explain what that module is, um, but that might not be the case for, for your code base. So we can look at uh, visualizing the dependencies in our project. Um, one tool that we can use is using a dependency matrix. Is this clear all the way in the back, by the way? Yes, no? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Tuck. Um, so, in the matrix, we can visualize the dependencies between our modules, and we can drill down to packages and classes, too. Um, but we see here the modules from our project, but they're sorted in a different way. The ones that other modules depend on are towards the bottom, and the modules that depend on them are towards the top. Obviously, since it's a matrix, the rows and the columns are the same, so the diagonal with the dashes would be the dependencies on itself, which aren't shown. And we see the dependencies here in the bottom. We can see from the legend that the blue means that there are dependencies between these um, components. Red would indicate any cyclic dependencies, so uh, mutual dependencies of A on B and B on A. Fortunately, we don't see any, and we can see that the dependencies flow from green to yellow. So if we click a module, we see that the core module uses several other modules and is in turn being used by several modules towards the top uh, listed in green. And if we look at specific cells, we can see this module uses that module this many times, uh, where the dots mean more than 99. Uh, so in this case, for example, Cucumber Java uses Cucumber Core many, many times. Um, so this helps us, can help us visualize a little bit the dependencies in our application. We can click different modules to get a feel for which modules use which other modules. And we can use this to draw our own diagram for maybe the things that we are specifically interested in. Or we can use tools that um, can generate diagrams for us. Um, which I was having a little trouble with yesterday, and again, apparently today. Um, so, unfortunately, the demo gods are not with me on this one. Um, <laughs> but uh, either your IDE will have ways for you to generate diagrams, or you can add plugins to your IDE to generate diagrams. Um, to help you visualize the code base, uh, both in terms of the dependencies or the classes. Um, 
If you've ever generated an automatic class diagram, you'll notice that they might have so many classes that it's hard to actually see them on one screen. So the tools might help you by being searchable or you can zoom in on different areas of the diagram. Um, however, it's actually recommended that you draw your own diagrams because um, for one, you will be able to draw diagrams for the sections that, or the areas that you're actually interested in and leave out a lot of other things you're not interested in. But also research has shown that if you draw your own diagrams, you'll be able to recall that information better in the future than if you're just looking at generated diagrams. Um, so it will actually help you understand by actively engaging with the material. Uh, but you can use these tools to generate diagrams for you um, as an input to your own diagrams. Um, so again, the strategies for a larger code base are fairly similar to a smaller piece of code. Identify the components in that code base and how they are related. Identify any concepts. So if in the Cucumber project, for example, a lot of the modules might have names that you're not familiar with, so stuff that you might want to research. Um, and gain context of how is this code base used uh, and help, that can help you understand uh, the code. So what's next? Um, I hope I've shown you some ways that you can practice reading code. Um, if you're interested, a Code Reading co Club uh, organize online sessions. Um, I'll share a link to all of the slides at the end as well. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so Code Reading Club, um, they organize online sessions once a month. They haven't over the summer and they haven't gotten, back, got, gotten started yet, but do check their website to see when they're, when they're organizing the next session if you'd like to join one. Alternatively, if you and your colleagues uh, or friends want to start your own club, Code Reading Club offer resor resources to start your own Code Reading Club. And they have three or four sessions already planned out for you with a code sample and exercises that you can do. Or if you can't find like-minded people or, or a session to join, uh, you can use the Code Reading Club resources um, and Felina's book, The Programmer's Brain, or her upcoming book, Code Reading in Practice. Uh, they all contain exercises that you can use yourself to practice reading code. So I'd highly recommend uh, using one of those or all of them. Uh, hopefully, I've shown you some of the ways that your tools can help you, uh, either inside your IDE or by adding plugins to your IDE uh, or tools outside of your IDE. Um, and uh, that you can use your brain and be aware of the processes in your brain when you're reading code, why it can be hard, and what you can do to help your brain with that. Thank you.